Now, our next speaker is certainly not an unfamiliar name to us. And I think he's someone all of us are looking forward to hearing this afternoon. He's none other than ex-Cabinet Minister, Mr. George Yeo. He's currently a visiting scholar at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. He has served in no less than 23 years in our Singapore government and was a minister for several portfolios during that time. Mr. Yeo was also a member of the Pontifical Commission for Reference on the Economic Administrative Structure of the Holy See in 2013 to 2014. And he was also on the Vatican Council for the Economy from February 2014 to July last year. He will be sharing about how it's indeed worthwhile to be living out our faith no least in the workplace. Before I invite him on, I thought I'll let you know that he will be taking questions immediately after his talk. So feel free to share these questions, send them through to Michael in the chat, and we'll pick up on them just a little later. For now, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Giorgio. Christ at work. In business, it is sometimes difficult to be a Christian. For example, uh, let's say we are in finance and we receive a tip, short the market. Short the market. Having taken a position, you want to, you want the market to go down. So you have a lot of negative feelings. If good news are reported, you're not happy. You want bad news. Or people who collect works of art. Sometimes in humor, but only half in humor, they said, once the artist has passed away, the value of the artwork goes up. Every day in business, because we've got to make profit. We have wishes and desires which are not always Christian. We have old staff, they are expensive, they are not as familiar with technology as younger ones. We find excuses to retrench or retire them. So these are moral dilemmas. Sometimes we shut ourselves off from these thoughts. We treat business as immoral. It's just a game we play. So we reserve religion for the family before we sleep on Sunday. But a large part of our life is at work, is in economic life. This was the the great insight of the founder of the Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escriva. He established the University of Navarra. And in 1958, with the help of the Harvard Business School, he established EASA Business School in Barcelona. I've been an advisor to EASA Business School for oh, maybe 12 to 15 years. It is like any other business school, case study, understanding of accounting, financial markets, marketing, product development, and so on. But every case study involves a discussion on the moral dilemmas in business. If we don't feel a dilemma, if we are not wrestling with our own conscience, then we become immoral and immorality quickly leads to evil. This is something that Christ at work must somehow be infused in our daily lives. The world today is in confusion. Accentuated but the social media. The social media is a force for good. It's also a force for evil. Today's event, today's wonderful event, could only be possible because of the social media. 
And despite COVID, we're able to, to be in communion, to be one with one another, to communicate, to enjoy each other's company. But the social media is also constantly manipulating us, creating addiction, reinf reinforcing our prejudices. So we have to be careful that we don't unwittingly get sucked into negative eddies, negative whirlpools, and with each turn sinking further and further. There is today a culture of condemnation. We are taught, in fact, we are incited to be angry, to criticize, to see the evil in the others. And the social media gives us echo chambers to reinforce all this negativism. It's much easier to reinforce negativism than to reinforce positivism that we all know. This morning, before coming here, I read that President Biden had called on Holy Father in Rome. They didn't talk about abortion. Holy Father told Biden that he's a good Catholic and please continue to receive Holy Communion. So Biden put it out, let it be known, because this is politically important to him. But I have no doubt that this will become a big political debate in the US, even within the Catholic community. We have become ideological. When we are ideological, we draw lines between ourselves. You're on my side, you're not on my side. We lose our humanity. We lose our brotherhood. We forget the words of St. Francis to be an instrument of the Lord, to serve love and to, to promote love when there's hatred, pardon when there's injury. This is something we have to think about, worry about in our daily lives, in the hawker center, in our workplace, when we're on the social media, when we talk to friends. Do we inside each other? Do we get into a negative spiral? Or do we help to uplift everyone around us? It doesn't mean that we don't take positions. We have positions, and it's important to have positions. But we can always look to the light. So where there is doubt, we sow hope. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is doubt, belief. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. In this way, the world gets better. The workplace gets better. And progressively, as a group, we move in the dire right direction, even as a society. The world is too big. And it's too difficult to be a saint. I know Holy Father has said, uh, he said, we're all called to be saints, but it's difficult to be a saint. And I don't think many of us want to be heroic. We just want to get on with our lives, but we are prepared to do little things. But little things, when they accumulate, can make a big difference. Avoid this cancel culture, this righteousness. Well, there's a famous pianist in China, Liu Yunti, from Sichuan, who recently got called out because he was with a prostitute in Beijing. And it became hit blind news everywhere. And suddenly, everything that he had done in the past has been forgotten. How often do we do this? We receive a piece of news, bad news about somebody, we amplify it, we condemn that person, and we feel righteous. But Jesus Christ reminded us, let those 
who are without sin cast the first stone? And who among us is without sin? And if we bear this in mind, Christ in us at work is what we should always try to achieve. So I'm, let me end here. And uh, Keith will, will, will share a session where uh, I'm happy to take your questions and answer uh, to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who has submitted questions so far. Keep them coming. Send them through to Michael, who is one of the co-hosts in this Zoom meeting. Okay. Thank you, by the way, for those words of wisdom. It's nice to start off the afternoon program being reminded of these things, you know, because indeed we do live in a society where, especially, as you mentioned, with social media, all the more it's easy to put down people. And I think all of us, if you've been keeping up with the news and all of that, there's been recent sagas, and it's just so easy to want to jump on the bandwagon and comment something that's negative. So I'd like to start, George, by asking you, how do you stay positive in general? And when you encounter, let's say, individuals or you encounter news that is not so positive about other people's failings, what is your disposition? How do you try to respond to these things? No, I also succumb to this dynamic. Uh, and, and sometimes after a social gathering, I go home, I think about it. I, it's like an examination of conscience. I said, oh no, I was too negative. I was unkind. Mm. I should give the other party the benefit of the doubt. It's so easy to criticize. You take this COVID situation. Everyone is an expert, but all of us are confused. And no one knows everything. And there are genuine uncertainties. So rather than quickly taking a position and trying to shout down the other party, listen, think about it. We don't really know. So give each other slack. And have more self-doubt rather than be righteous and thinking that, no, I'm right, he's wrong. And he's doing this to harm me or he's, he's being selfish. Maybe I'm being selfish. Maybe I'm wrong. It is possible. Mm. So it's really this practice as we, uh, as you mentioned, an examination of conscience perhaps in our days, reflecting on ourselves and reminding ourselves, first of all, that we are human. We are not perfect. We too have our own failings. And hopefully through that, you know, be able to look at others with eyes of mercy and compassion. Yeah? Okay. I'd like to ask you, uh, um, because I, I imagine in your time in politics especially, you must have gotten criticism from people who didn't agree with policies, whether uh, they were mooted by you or by your party. What was that experience like, you know, being on the receiving end of such criticism? What was that like for you and how did you, in a way, bring your faith into the picture and perhaps also bring encouragement into that environment around you? You can't go into politics if you don't have thick skin because whatever you do, you'll be criticised, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. And you're required to put on a brave front. And even when something hurts, you kind of file it away, but it comes back to you. Some people have become callous, so they no longer feel these things. I think that's wrong. It's important to remain sensitive inside, to wrestle with your conscience. The day we stop wrestling with our conscience, I think that day, we're in trouble. Sometimes, a good word, a whisper of encouragement, a gesture of kindness uplifts you for the entire day. Jacks up your morale and you feel spirited, happy, joyful. All of us have experienced uh, such moments. So if we can experience this, others will experience it too. And if a kind word, sincerely spoken, can make such a difference to our spirit, why don't we 
in turn be kind to others and lift up their spirits. Again, sincerely, not in an artificial way. And if through our daily life, in the workplace, in school, in the train, at the bus station, in the shopping center, when we are driving, instead of suddenly becoming very angry because somebody sounded the horn, just apologize, just wave. Temper comes down, people feel happier. But you know how many of us, when we're behind the steering wheel, we, we, we get so emotional. You know, somebody hung on, we get very angry and goes on for minutes, thinking that, why has he wronged us in this way? Didn't he know such and such? I know it's difficult, but if we can, we should try and snap out of it and say, look, no, no, no. This, this is going down the wrong path. Just be a bit positive. Maybe the person was really upset because he misunderstood what we were trying to do and, and he, he had a fright. It's okay. Sorry. Yeah. And sometimes that happens in church car parks too. Huh? <laughs> Maybe my pre-COVID days, you know, sometimes you see little tiffs going on. But as you rightly pointed out, we do not know the circumstances. We do not know the events that have been happening in people's lives and how they come into a space. But we know ourselves and we can control ourselves and how we respond. So we can give people the benefit of the doubt in that sense. Huh? We know how to be mm. nice to powerful people, to rich people. Mm. We're automatically nice to them. <laughs> but we take one another for granted. And the people who serve us, who are employees, we, as the Chinese say, in kaita, no, you just take it as a matter of course. But they're also human beings. And we should always remember to appreciate, to be considerate. And, and you come back to us. Mm. And we do one consideration. We do one affirmation. We do one appreciation. Mm. Mm. Well said, well said. By the way, a big thank you to all of you who have been submitting questions. There's one that's just come through from Helena. Um, it's been mentioned a little bit. We've kind of touched on it a bit. Um, a bit challenging one, okay? So I may it may seem like I'm putting you on the spot, but... Reading out question, okay? Yeah. It says, George, you, how have you been living out Christ at work, especially in positions of influence and in key advisory positions? So, how was it like living out your Christian and your Catholic values in such situations? Mm. Uh, it's hard for me to talk about myself. Let me put it this way, that, that I'm bothered by these things. And it soaks up emotional energy. Sometimes I ask myself, why don't I just ignore it, you know, let it like water off a duck's back. Then I tell myself, no, no, it's important. Let some of the water soak in. Because when you stop feeling a struggle, that's not a good sign. You become insensitive. So it's good that you, you react, that you think about uh, what has happened, that you have an examination of conscience. Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot say that I, 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 I'm good at this, but I, I, I think I try to be. Mm. Okay. And we have a question from Marion Go, and I think it's a question also that many of us might have. Um, what was your experience working like in the Vatican or with the Vatican in those capacities that you were in? I remember. Not, not, not many Singaporeans get that opportunity, la, right? So. No, it, it was it was an incredible honor, completely unexpected, and something I could not have an ambition for. But so I was asked. So I did my best. Uh, an incredible honor, but also an incredible experience. Before I went for my first meeting, I called on Archbishop William Goh for his, for his advice and for his blessing. He, he, I think he wanted to prepare me psychologically. He said, Josh, you'll be disappointed when you go to the Vatican. 
I said, why? He said, because there are many things which are not what you think they are. And in fact, if things were going swimmingly well, there would have been no need for the Pope to establish these committees and this new Council for the Economy. But I know he was preparing me psychologically. Then he prayed for me, which I appreciated. The Buddhists have this illustration that from the mud, the most beautiful lotus spring forth. So one can say, oh, there's so much mud. But look into it. There are things happening. And goodness comes out of it. If one spirit is of only of condemnation, you will never have lotuses. But if you have a positive spirit, there will be blooms. And sometimes the international media, any scandal in the Vatican, they will, they will headline and underline. Well, rightly so. But the church also does wonderful things all over the world, much of which is underreported. The church has many heroes, many of whom are unsung. But we are not doing these things for the power and the glory. We are doing it because it is right and because it brings glory to our Creator. And we are judged not by what we say, but by what we do. And if in our little ways, in the workplaces, when we are driving at the shopping center, at a hawker center, little acts of kindness, people say, who is he? Oh, he's a Christian. They are like that. In that way, we evangelize. Yeah, actually, that was something that came up in this morning's conversation in one panel discussion. It was very clear, you know, this common thread of how all of us in our own little ways, all of us are Christ to people by our very example, just by the little acts of love that we bring. You know, one person even said, we are quite possibly the only sermon some people will ever hear because they will never step into a church. And we are quite possibly the only form of scriptures that people will ever read, okay, metaphorically, of course, because maybe they don't encounter the faith or are evangelized to in a very direct way. So all of us come to love in our small little ways. Okay, still in the Vatican, I'm wondering, George, you know, having had that inside look how ready do you think the Vatican is to face the secular challenges of the modern world? Difficult question, huh? I know. But this one all submitted by people. Good questions, people. Keep them coming. Well, one thing I learned in the Vatican is there is faith. I remember once talking to a cardinal about the Vatican's relationship with China, which has been difficult. In the 19th century, the Western powers when they were impinging on China, they demanded that pastors and priests be allowed to enter China against the wishes of the Qing court. So Christianity for a long time was seen as part of an imperial bullying of China. And when China became, had its revolution and became communist, there was naturally an anti-Christian reaction as part of an anti-imperialistic reaction. But in recent years, there has been great improvement. And the Vatican has made it clear that it is not part of a larger Western uh, strategy against China. So a lot of things have happened which um, should give us reasons for hope. So one day I was discussing this Roman cardinal about the Vatican's relationship with China. And they had already taken some steps towards reconciliation. He ended by saying, I hope we have taken the right decision and we should pray about it. In other words, the problems of the Vatican are not the problems of the Vatican. They're the problems of the world. And the Vatican will we'll overcome them 
Not because the Vatican is smart and capable and have good leaders, but because God wants it to happen. And uh, the Vatican should always see itself as an instrument of God, not its own instrument. The day it sees itself as its own instrument, then it becomes worldly and becomes no more than any other political power, which it should never be. No, the, the reason why I, I got involved in the Vatican was because I learned this much later. Pope Francis, when he created the commission, he told a cardinal who was organizing it, he said, I want a Chinese. Mm. As a signal, I think. And the cardinal went around saying, w w how do I find a Chinese? So someone said, well, there's this guy who's lost the elections, he's available. <laughs> <laughs> And he's never been ashamed of declaring himself a Catholic, so maybe you should ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think they had to do some background checks on me first. Yeah. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And, and of course, he cleared it. Uh, cleared it well. If not, they wouldn't have appointed you. La. But they couldn't have found a better guy, I think. But what do I know? Anyway, more <laughs> questions coming in. Um, this one, very, very practical question. Um, and it comes from Celestine, who asks, how do we change employers to be more merciful and em empathic? As George has mentioned, that employers are retre retrenching older workers who are slower with technology or perceived to be inefficient, but they have this wealth of experience to share. Another person asks something similar, you know, um, you know, how do we balance our responsibility as corporates, as corporate leaders, um, but, you know, for example, in cost streamlining exercise where automation would clearly benefit the organization, but would mean reduction to hit count. So how do we balance things like this, you know, keeping older workers who seemingly are not as efficient as younger ones, or even having workers in the first place as compared to moving to automation? With difficulty, with, with the greatest difficulty. Uh, in some companies, in some countries, CEOs who bite the bullet, who would slash and burn to improve the numbers, they are, they are highlighted as effective leaders. And the markets may even reward him by buying shares in that company. But I'm very skeptical about the ability of new leaders to come in for a few years and to turn things upside down and produce better numbers. Usually these numbers are superficial because if you do that to human beings, you're creating long-term problems. And these long-term problems will resurface. It's not possible to avoid bad bosses in life, whether it's in the army, in the civil service, in the private sector, there will always be bad bosses. Even within the family, within the extended family, we've got to live with one another. Not everyone is reasonable. But I know not all of us can be Jesus Christ and just take the punishment, uncomplaining. So it is a dilemma. Maybe we should think of changing jobs. Maybe we are part of the problem. Maybe we can do something to help the situation, maybe not. I don't know. Find a good boss. Find a good leader. As best we can. But despite our best efforts, there will always be disappointment. So, rather than blaming on bad luck or the external environment, maybe the answer is in ourselves. Yes, you are unjustly treated. Is it that serious? Our pride has been wounded. Is it really that devastating? Can we live with it? Can we find meaning in what we do? And if we can, after a while, people will say, look, he's an incredible person. We need more like him. And organizations which do well have many such people. Mm. Mm. Okay, we turn our attention away from politics, away from your time in the Vatican, as well as, you know, away a little bit from you know, 
being a leader in a business and making tough decisions to something a bit more personal. So this comes from Charles T. Thank you, Charles. He asks, George, did the miracles you receive in your life from God's graces to cure your wife and son from their medical conditions change your view of life? How did that impact you? Of course. I mean, sometimes you think that you're invincible, that everything is going your way, that you've found the right current. And then in the middle of it, something happens which shows that you're nothing. That you're co completely at the mercy of forces larger than yourselves. Then you're taught humility. Then you're challenged mm. to do the right thing. Yeah. I think it's important when we succeed, when we do well, not to be too self-satisfied. Uh, it's very often not completely due to our own effort, but due to circumstances over which we have no control, and also to divine blessings. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and on a very personal note, when you need to retreat from the humdrum of work and daily life, where do you go to or what do you do to recharge your spiritual batteries, if you like? I, I'm a bit of a Taoist, so I, I, uh, I, I do Tai Chi, I, I, uh, I do some calligraphy, so I, I tend to introspect, uh, and of course, I pray, and I try to understand the divine plan in creation how we are inserted into it and what is the role we play. Of course, we are nothing compared to the all of creation. But human beings are special. And human beings are special, not each in himself, but because he's part of a college, a communion, a larger humanity. So I, I'm a little unusual. I, I tend to philosophize about these things. And, and even when I'm praying, uh, these thoughts course through my mind. But I do spend quite a lot of time uh, reflecting on, on the wonder and the beauty of creation. That's beautiful. And you know, actually, that transits very well to our next panel discussion, uh, which is on taking care of God's earth. We have a panel speaking all about Laudato Si and, uh -huh. and what, what that's like, how we can also you know, put that into practice, yes. whether it's in our corporate organizations, whether it's in parishes, or even in just our daily lives. So nice way to end and kind of link us off to our next panel discussion. George, thank you so much for being here with us, for sharing your wisdom. You know, just from the way you share, I can tell that there's been, you've had clearly a lot of life experiences, a lot of being in different situations in different places, and also perhaps at a nice ripe old age, being able to be quite philosophical about things, you know, and at the same time, being able to count all your blessings, knowing that everything comes from the hand of God. Is that fair to say? I was asked to choose a topic, mm. so I chose it is all worthwhile. It came from something I saw in the Opus Dei institution in Rome when I attended, when my wife and I and two of our sons attended the canonization of Jose Maria. It had a Spanish word, vale la pena, and they told me that it, it meant it is all worthwhile, that whatever we do in whatever station of life, the little things done well are worth doing and makes life worth living. Yeah. Amen. No better way we could have ended. Once again, thank you so much, George. Thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take all of them. Keep them coming for the next two panel discussions. As I mentioned just a short while ago, we'll move into our next one shortly, which is really about caring for creation. Stay with us. Dear friends of CBN, as you know, CBN is not a funded organization, and we run all our programs and services free of cost. 
We depend on your donations and love offerings to keep our programs going. Kindly help us with your love offerings uh, by using the QR code and your banking app using scan to pay, or you can send us checks or bank transfers as per the instructions. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for tuning in to Catholic Business Network's Christ at Work Conference. If you found this video helpful, please click the like button. And if you're new to our channel, do follow us on all our social media platforms and click on the subscribe button and the bell icon to get a notification whenever we post a new video. Thank you and God bless.